I will soon become the tenth person, and my dog will become the first dog to walk around the world. Ask me anything. As the title states, in about three months, I will become the tenth person to have walked around the world and my dog will become the first dog to have done so. Seven years ago I left my home in New Jersey to embark on a 25,000 mile, seven continent, walk around the world, which didn't go entirely to plan due to COVID. After four months of walking, I adopted a dog, Savannah, and together we've covered 22,500 miles across 35 countries. When Savannah was a pup I pushed her in my cart. Now she'll walk 30 miles a day and still be running circles at night. We've spent nearly every minute of every day together. From navigating chaotic cities and strange new environments, Save and I are totally in sync. She's my best bud and absolutely rock solid. The Dodo did a video on her. I'm walking around the world because of a friend who died at 17. Her death led me to understand how fleeting my life is and impressed on me the need to make the most of the short time I have. When I discovered Carl Bushby the idea of walking around the world stuck in my head as a way to live a full life. From 17 to 26 I went to college, worked, paid off loans, saved, then set off before I had too much responsibility. During the first two years of this adventure, I walked from New Jersey to Uruguay. I was held up at knife point in Panama, did ayahuasca in the Amazon, and climbed 15,000 feet over the Chilean Andes. They were incredibly clarifying years. The endless hours of walking allowed me to reach a profound acceptance of my life, my choices, and my idiosyncrasies. During the three years after walking the Americas, I was almost taken out by a bacterial infection, needed seven months to recover, then walked Europe, North Africa, across Turkey, and into Azerbaijan. I peregrinated the Camino in Spain, had a 24-hour police escort through Algeria, visited the village of my family name, Turchik, in Croatia, and became the first private citizen granted permission to cross the Bosphorus Bridge on foot, the Istanbul Bridge which crosses from Europe to Asia. These years nurtured in me an appreciation for how history, geography, and circumstance affect everything from culture to the economy in different countries. People are the same everywhere. It's the greater and often uncontrollable forces that affect their and their country's fate. Since getting caught in a COVID lockdown in Azerbaijan two years ago, the walking has become immensely more challenging. My planned route from Kazakhstan to Mongolia, then walking the coast of Australia, became impossible due to border closures. I may do by walking more of Turkey while waiting for the world to reopen, then walking Uzbekistan and the mountains of Kyrgyzstan. But by the time I finished walking Kyrgyzstan, much of the world remained closed, so Savannah and I flew to Seattle and began the last leg of our journey, a 3,000-mile walk back home to New Jersey. Strangely enough, this walk across my home country has proved the most difficult section of the journey. With the end in sight, I feel like it's taking every ounce of effort I have just to finish this thing. When this is all over I plan to write a memoir and a children's book, but the world walk has been my life for so long that I'm certain my transition back to normal life won't be easy. Currently, Save and I are posted up in Kansas waiting out a winter storm so I thought this would be the perfect moment for an AMA. This infographic on my site provides a great visualization of most of our walk. And this video from Sunrise Australia provides the best summation of our journey. Also, there's this great article Afar wrote on me and Savannah. If you'd like to follow along I do my best to post photos, film short videos, and write the occasional blog post. Do you worry at all about Savannah having to adapt to the more stationary lifestyle since she has basically been on one long walk her whole life? I know she's highly adaptable, but I'm still worried about the adjustment. We're walking 6 to 8 hours a day now and she still has energy when we set camp. I'll be going on some long walks when I'm done just for her sake. But also, she's 7 now and I think it's probably good that we're going to slow down. 7 is a good time for a dog to retire to a life of leisure. What country was the most challenging to walk through? Are you now well versed in international bureaucracy and paperwork? How did you handle all of that with language barriers? Did you find love on the road at all? Algeria was the most challenging not because of the terrain or the weather, but because I had a police escort with me 24-7. At first, it was nice to feel protected and have local guides whenever I hit a town, but after about two weeks it started driving me mad. I was used to lots of solitude and now I was being fretted over every time I paused to make sure I was okay. All the officers were immensely friendly, 
but simply having eyes on me all the time wore on me. And towards the end of Algeria, because the police wouldn't let me camp, there were about five straight days I had to walk from sunup to sundown in order to reach a hotel. Temperature-wise, Costa Rica was the most challenging country. It was so hot and humid that in order to get any sort of mileage and I began waking at 4 a.m., then stopping at 10 a.m. because it was too hot to walk after that. At one point, the soles of cheap sneakers I bought there literally melted off. Not fun. I was sweating day and night. And yeah, I'd say I'm pretty deft at managing bureaucracy. At least when it comes to wrangling visas and sorting out Savannah's paperwork. I did. Right at the end. Met a girl in Washington state. We've been dating since. How many pairs of shoes boots did you go through? And how did you take care of your body after walking for so long each day? Obviously, traveling on foot around the entire earth must do a number to a guy. I've probably gone through about 45 pairs of shoes, but I stopped counting a long while back. At the end of each day, I do as much stretching as the weather permits. Sometimes it's just a little hamstring stretch in the tent, but the more I can do the better. I definitely feel the effects of a long day more if I don't stretch. Overall though, my body feels good. No lingering injuries or aches. How did you pay for the travel? I worked summers through college, worked after college, sometimes two jobs, lived at home to save, paid off most of my loans then readied myself to leave when I thought I had enough to make it the two years down to Argentina. Before leaving, however, Philadelphia signed, a hometown company, the owner of which knew my friend who passed, offered to sponsor me and donate a dollar a mile into her scholarship fund. They give me a bit of money every two weeks. That enabled me to throw the rest of my savings at my loans and pay them off. Through Central and South America I basically only paid for food and the very infrequent motel. When I reached Europe, I started a Patreon to get me through the higher cost of living. Now I'll also do the occasional photography job as well. Other than getting sick, what were the physical effects of this journey on your body? Other than that infection, I'd say all of them have been positive. The main thing is probably just the general physical stamina I've developed. I've had friends and family visit, most of who are fairly physically active, but when we go for a hike or spend all day walking around a city, I'm never remotely tired before they are. But who knows how much that would translate to running or swimming. Separately, the walk has given me a profound appreciation for my body. I've seen where it's capable of taking me, so keeping myself in shape one way or another will be something I'll do for the rest of my life. One of the best feelings I've consistently had is exhaustion. It helps me appreciate the smallest things. Water and a bowl of pasta become a Michelin star meal. A tent becomes a mansion, and laying down on an air mattress may as well be paradise. How difficult is it to walk across the ocean? Only accessible to God Mode players, unfortunately. Can you explain the police escort in Algeria more? Sure. Following a coup, an extremely violent civil war engulfed Algeria from 91 to 02. Hundreds of thousands of people were killed, many of them civilians. In 99, Bouteflika was elected with the promise of bringing peace to the country. An amnesty law was introduced and many people gave up their arms. Since then, security has remained a priority, and Bouteflika remained in office until only a few years ago. Algeria is also a petro-state. It's a fairly closed country and has close trade relations with few countries and only permits visa-free entry to the citizens of a handful of countries, five, I believe. For a US citizen to enter, they need a letter of invitation from an Algerian stating they take responsibility for US citizens' safety. My ex-boss's mother did that for me. But after I entered, and I told the police my intentions, they thought it best that my safety become the responsibility of each township I passed through. So about three times a day, a new set of officers would accompany me. Today, Algeria is a very safe country. Whether that's because of the sprawling police presence, I can't say. Worked for me though. How did you keep enough dog food? I've been wanting to backpack with my dog who loves to hike but I'm not too sure what the most efficient way to carry dog food. Oh yeah. That's a tough one with a backpack. I push a big baby carriage which makes more sense than a backpack for the very extended walking I'm doing. That has enabled me to pick up 6 pounds of dog food and load up on water before crossing stretches of the desert, or Wyoming. Yeesh. In your case I can only say bring some high protein dog food. I find Savannah eats a lot less of that than the less filling cheap stuff. Did you ever have any problems with water or electricity? 
Were other dogs sometimes a problem for sweet little Savannah? Did you always have internet? Took it all day to upload videos or did it go quickly? Did you cross the super dangerous Darien Gap by foot or did you avoid this particular area? Have you experienced anything spooky or paranormal along the way? I'd want to ask you a million questions. But I'll better leave it at those five. Laughing face. I've definitely been in some tight spots when it comes to water. There are a few instances that come to mind. One of them was in northern Peru where the desert and the lack of infrastructure caught me off guard. I had just descended from the mountains of Ecuador where water and public infrastructure were plentiful so I was accustomed to easy access to water. It was one of the starkest transitions between countries and I had no time to adjust. I had to ask a few locals for some large bottles of water to get me through. In Central and South America especially save and I had frequent run-ins with territorial strays. There were times I'd be stressed out for hours because dog after dog would charge out of their home at us. I've become very adept at fending them off. Most strays just bark until you get out of their territory. There were only two instances that come to mind when I was genuinely worried that a dog would rip my leg off or kill save if it had the chance. I don't always have internet. But whatever country I'm in I'll buy a local SIM card. Uzbekistan had very sparse internet, as did stretches of desert in Peru and Chile, and there was no internet in the mountains of Kyrgyzstan. In those cases I just enjoy being disconnected and post whenever I get back into reception. Didn't cross the Darien Gap. But Carl Bushby did. He's a bad dude. Lots of spooky moments at night when your sense are playing tricks on you. I followed your journey on Facebook. Read all your updates. You and Savannah are an inspiration to many. I enjoyed all the beautiful pictures and such. As a question, what are you gonna do now? Don't see you doing a 9 to 5 job grin. Thanks for following. It's a question I'm asking myself and something I'll need to figure out over the next few years. When I stop I'll definitely be writing a memoir if for no other reason than to process everything I've gone through. How much has this trip cost you, whether from your own pockets or from donations? The first two years about $12,000 a year maybe less, plus intercontinental flights. The remaining years, probably $30,000 a year. Through Central and South America I was young and on fire. I would have done just about anything to make this walk happen. The first year I walked from NJ to Panama City and slept in a bed I paid for maybe three weeks total. Two of those weeks were in a hostel on Lake Atitlan in Guatemala so I could study Spanish. In Europe, money was very tight. My Patreon was a supplement to my sponsorship but I only paid for food, the occasional hotel, ferries to and from Africa, and Savannah's paperwork for crossing borders. I was stuck in San Sebastian, Spain waiting for a visa extension and was only able to stay in the city because the guy who rented a room of his Airbnb to me for a bit told me he'd let me stay for free. From Turkey on it's been cheap again. The cost of living is low in Turkey, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Uzbekistan, and Kyrgyzstan. My main expenses have been flights because COVID stopped land border crossings in those countries. It's a cheap life. I'm basically only paying for food and the occasional hotel and rare flight. Hi Tom, thank you for doing this AMA. I've been following you for years and you've inspired me to travel more so thank you for what you do. My question is what will be your plans once you are done with your walk? Will you settle down permanently or do you plan to do shorter trips? Hey, thanks for the question. The plan right now is to take at least a year to settle in somewhere, not travel and work on a memoir and children's book. I'm sure I'll continue traveling in the future, certainly some hikes, but I doubt I'll be walking across any more countries. It's so demanding on the mind and body. I'm really looking forward to not living out of a baby carriage and actually having friends around for a bit. Imagine walking the entire planet just to end up back in Jersey? JK I'm from Bergen County, what part of Jersey are you from? Haha I love Jersey. I'm from Camden County. How much time and money went into planning out and preparing yourself before the adventure? There wasn't much money put into planning the walk. Mostly it was a lot of reading, the occasional two or three day hike, and a conversation with Carl Bushby which helped tremendously. On a large scale, there were only few criteria that went into planning my trip. I knew I wanted to hit every continent and I wanted to do that with as little stoppage due to visas as possible. I researched visa requirements for American citizens then drew a rough route. Then I created my timeline by figuring I would average 15 miles a day. That allowed me to walk through some fairly mild weather, avoid a North African summer and reach Uruguay by the end of their summer to catch a boat to Antarctica. On a day-to-day -day basis, 
It took me a while to figure out what roads were best to walk. In the beginning, I walked these winding PA roads that nearly killed me. I learned to prioritize farm roads or those with a shoulder. For the Americas, I basically followed the Pan American Highway and Europe has an amazing network of bike routes. I wouldn't say my route planning is day to day, but maybe week to week. Did you ever need to seek veterinary care for save when on the road? If so, what was the situation and how did it go? Only twice. Once was in Spain when a seed somehow wedged itself between her knuckles. It ended up coming out on its own in a few days. The other time was far more harrowing. We were in the Atacama Desert in northern Chile, hiding from the sun against a lane barrier when Savannah sneezed and her nose began pouring out blood as thin as water. I was able to wave down a car that took use to a town about 40 minutes down the road. Then I cleaned her up enough to get us a hotel room for the night. She bled through the night. I bought a sedative from the local pharmacy, but there was no veterinary clinic there. She was losing so much blood she almost looked pale. The next day I convinced a cabbie to drive us four hours to Arica, a city on the northern coast. The vet knew what she had immediately. Apparently, there's a tick in southern Peru that will pass on an infection that causes a dog's platelets to drop to zero. With some medication, Save was back to normal in a week or two. But it was one of the more terrifying ordeals of my life. You can read about it on my blog here. TheWorldWalk.com, The Saga of Savannah Part 1. Now that Australia has, recently, reopened its borders are you considering extending your walk? I'm not sure honestly. I would consider doing it myself, but if I did I don't think I'd bring Savannah with me. The flight is maybe a day long and there's a mandatory 10-day quarantine for her. She doesn't care about walking Australia, so all that seems like too much unnecessary unpleasantness to put her through. How did you deal, or adapt to, the loneliness at times? I've been following you for years and as a fellow New Jerseyan, I'm just in awe at everything you've done. Thanks. Glad to have had you along. Hmm. That's a good question. The first two years I don't think I felt much loneliness at all. Every day was a wave of new challenges, and I was so on fire with the idea that I was actually living my dream that I didn't give thought to anything else. But loneliness grew at a few points during the walk. After the bacteria infection was one, I had been in physical pain for so long, that when I started back up again I found my usual upbeat thoughts had a dark bend to them. I kept thinking, what am I doing out here? The days felt pointless. It wasn't until I joined the Camino in Spain that I got out of that darkness. On the Camino, I had a community in a way I never had before. I had people to eat breakfast with, to talk with while walking, and to expound on the beauty of simple living. That was enough to pull me out of my funk and get me back to enjoying the act of living free. Recently, a different sort of loneliness has found me. It's not as painful as the other. It's more an eagerness to spend time with my friends and family again. With the end so near I can't help but think of the time I'll get to spend with all the people I've been away from for so long. I look back and see just how much emotional weight I've been carrying. I'm ready to set the walk aside, to set the solitude aside and enjoy being part of a community again. I'm eager for simple things. Sitting with a friend or sharing dinner with my grandparents. It amounts to a broader loneliness, one tinged with love and not bitterness.